started. Uh, we're at five after six now. And um, yeah, so we'll get started. I'm going to do some opening remarks here and then I will uh, hand it over to Donna. That's good. So I'd like to open this session with a land acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather today is the territory traditionally used by the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral peoples. We also acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge and philosophies of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land today. Taking a moment at the beginning of our program to make this acknowledgement is an invitation for reflection and a reminder of the gratitude and accountability non-Indigenous people owe to the people of this, to the first people of this land. Land acknowledgements are one step on the path toward reconciliation. Reconciliation is about building relationships of trust, respect, and friendship. It is about acknowledging both the lived experiences of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, and the experiences passed down through generations of trauma. Reconciliation rejects prejudice and requires that all those within this country learn about Indigenous cultures, history, and experiences the dishonor of treaties being a part of both history and current day experiences. YWCA Cambridge acknowledges that reconciliation must include walking with Indigenous peoples as they lead the way. So good evening. Thank you so much for attending our first talk in a series of talks on women in data science. My name is Ashley Locke and I'm the program coordinator for Uplift. Uplift is our reskilling employment program out of YWCA Cambridge. We're proud to be partnering with Roche Canada tonight to present this special evening session covering topics such as pathways into data science, being a woman in a male dominated workspace and how data science is evolving and the careers that it offers. Your questions are welcome and we will be holding a Q&A following the talk. Please add any questions to the Q&A below on your screen. Please note this call is being recorded. A recording will be available following the session. This will be available via YWCA Cambridge YouTube channel and emailed directly to all those that registered. We'll take a, a quick poll just now, just uh, to get a glimpse into the room and who's present. So if you could take a moment just to fill out that poll, um, we'll just maybe give it 30 seconds. And it just gives us an idea about um, where the crowd's at and also, um, I guess for me, just how many people are actually really interested in data science who aren't currently participating in uh, or working in the data science industry, so. That is great. Um, so we'll keep letting that go on. And I think I have to turn that off in order for me to move forward with this. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much to everybody that participated in that. Um, for some reason, my, there we go. Now it is my absolute pleasure to welcome to our virtual stage, six women who are excelling in the data science field. All of these women bring to the table knowledge in the data science field and excel within their industry. I'm proud to introduce our moderator tonight who has worked diligently to help put together uh, tonight's evening. Donna Jansen is the Director of Evidence Generation and Strategic Collaborations at Roche Canada in Medical and Regulatory Affairs. She's worked for Roche for over 20 years in country clinical operations and medical and regulatory affairs divisions in a variety of roles. Her current team is accountable for developing strategic evidence plans for the Roche portfolio, as well as execution of RWG studies and in investigator <laughs> initiated research occurring in Canada. She has a passion for, and I am so sorry, here we go. Yeah, developing and mentoring people and it is with this passion that she has led the partnership that the YWCA Cambridge is proud to have with Roche Canada. So without further ado, Donna, please take us into the world of women in data science. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Ashley, for the kind words. And uh, hello to everyone, a virtual uh, hello. And we're really looking forward to spending the next uh, few hours with you. Uh, as, as Ashley mentioned, uh, the, the lovely ladies that you see here are all um, Roche Canada employees. We are a pharmaceuticals division, but we also have a diagnostics division. And uh, it's definitely a company that I would say is on the, the cutting edge of data science, innovation, artificial intelligence, and, and really trying to, to move uh, the Canadian healthcare and global healthcare systems into the future. So we're definitely looking forward to spending some time answering any questions you may have. Uh, we honestly had an overwhelming uh, interest of people that wanted to share their career paths, uh, their experiences. So what we've tried to do is uh, bring together kind of a, a cross-functional group of individuals that come from different parts of the organization, but also perhaps have different pathways and, uh, you know, different approaches to uh, how they're working in their current field. So hopefully we've, you know, tried to cover um, a breadth of, of diverse kind of uh, both individuals and different um, career opportunities in, in the data science space. So I think what we'd like to start with, first of all, is to allow each of the speakers to introduce themselves. Um, I'll try and give you guys each about five minutes so you can do a bit of a, a summary of uh, whatever you'd like to share about yourself to really set the context for this evening. So I have first up uh, with Fanny. I would like you to start us off, please. Sure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. We're really excited to be here and we were talking about it as a group the other day. It, it is amazing to be able to give back and to be able to share our experiences. Um, my name is Fanny C. I'm the head of artificial intelligence and digital health for Roche Canada. Um, I'd like to say that my uh, roadmap of my life had this very linear pattern, but I think I kind of fell into a lot of the, the experiences and the roles that I had. Um, I actually started off in the clinic as a radiation therapist, uh, practicing radiation delivery for about eight, nine years at Princess Margaret Hospital, during which time I did a lot of research and development and implementation of new technologies in the area of imaging and uh, EMR development. I realized when I looked at all the innovative research that was happening that all of that innovative research wasn't actually making it to the clinic floor and I didn't understand that. I still felt like people were still waiting in waiting rooms with their clipboards and their pens and we were still changing waiting times with these paper signs that we'd make and sort of the innovative devices we had were like tape and pencils and styrofoam and, and, and that's what we had at our fingertips but we saw all of this research happening because we were an academic giant uh, and so I went back to school to learn a bit, a bit, a bit about business and was really working on learning about the commercial pipeline. You know, maybe it was finance, maybe it was the business deals about commercializing new innovation that was stumbling in terms of being able to bring emerging technology to the market. So went to business school, learned the jargon, came out of business school, realized that I didn't know anything about business, but I, I knew some of the words. Um, so I started working for a, a multinational in more of the business realm in terms of clinical workflow, implementing new technologies in cancer centers all over the world. And I think that's where I, I kind of learned about a lot of the major barriers to innovation making it to the market. And um, it, it really is a multidisciplinary feat. It's about being able to bring in physicians, physicists, patients, administration, patient advocacy groups, government to the table in order to actually integrate something for the benefit of the system. And so I thought that I could help in the innovation sector. So I ended up going to Mars Discovery District where I was involved more at the being able to translate some of those academic inventions into the marketplace via startup company creation or licensing deals with other industry partners. Um, that was phenomenal because I had the chance to be able to grow companies as well as act as a venture capitalist in, in determining which ones would take priority in terms of return on investment. I thought that was really, really cool. And, and when you look at the amount, the amount of brain power in Canada, 
all of the things that you see in Star Trek or in science fiction movies. And it's actually possible. It's just our ability to productize and scale it in the world. And so, um, you know, I, I took a stent in the federal government, an arm of the federal government called Canada Health Info Way, because I wanted to be able to take or be able to learn how to take some of those innovations and implement them at scale, not so much taking the fancy technology and only uh, allowing for a small group to access it, but I wanted to be part of a health system that bred equity and inclusion. So I started working for an organization called Canada Health Employee, focused on digital health and the deployment of national digital health projects. Um, phenomenal group, learned a lot about provincial and federal government and um, built a number of programs that built the bridges between private and public organizations. And um, from there, I went to Roche. And there, I, I saw all of my experiences being able to mature and be um, embraced by this transforming organization with people who were entrepreneurial and progressive and weren't afraid to take risks and were supportive. And it's like, it, it much to Donna's point earlier, it, it's a group of people that you wanna work with. They are going to change the world, I'm convinced. So that's a little bit about my path and, and also the women that um, sit here in this room with me. Amazing intro, Fanny, thank you so much. So next up, I have Nusheen. So I'm going to pass the baton to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today with you. Um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I am British. Um, so I did my undergrad um, in the University of London in biochemistry. And then I went to work for a, a DNA um, paternity testing lab <clears throat> that was a spin-off company from, from a university. So I was doing a DNA paternity testing for the home office. Um, I spent a few months there and then I moved to a hospital lab where I did um, research and it was a, a gene therapy lab um, doing research on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. <clears throat> And then I got a scholarship in the UK to do my master's. So I went back to school and I did a, a master's in molecular biology and biotechnology. And I went back into the lab. So I worked for a UK government um, where we did research in genetically modified organisms. And it was at that point, my third lab, that I realized um, I wasn't a good fit for the lab and the lab wasn't a good fit for me. What I had envisioned the research to be was not what it was. And I needed to make a change. So this was in my mid twenties. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but um, I thought I'd try the pharmaceutical industry. And I approached a recruiter who found this job in, in an area called clinical data management for a very small company, and I had no idea what it was, <clears throat> only what I could find on the internet, but they seemed to like me and they thought I had transferable skills. And that's where my journey in um, the field of clinical data management, which has actually evolved to data science um, at Roche has been so for the last 20 years, I've been working for different companies. I did move from the UK 20 years ago to the West Coast, and I was recruited by a company there that was actively recruiting from Britain because um, we had a lot of expertise in Britain, so they were hiring from there. And so I spent 10 years on Vancouver Island, and then 10 years ago, I moved here. I've been with Roche for the past six years, and it's been an, a fantastic journey so far. Sorry, I'm sure I'll say many times tonight I'm on mute, so hopefully I'll get, get the hang of it. <laughs> Uh, thank you again, Nasheen. Uh, really great reflections on uh, on the career path. Okay, so next up, I have Emmy. Please take it away. Sorry, I have the same trouble to unmute myself. So I'm Emmy Chung. I'm a, a principal statistical scientist and also project lead statistician and uh, data sciences team lead. And I has been work with Roche for past five years, started from uh, working on oncology studies, hematology studies. Now I'm working on the rare disease 
uh, particularly trying to find a better treatment for lupus, which is a disease that impacts majorly women. And I, every day I feel my work is so meaningful as a woman. And uh, so before I joined Roche, I work with the McMaster University and also St. Joseph Healthcare Hamilton for about 10 years in the academia, like research, help with uh, the McMaster Children's Hospital and their like uh, medical department uh, for research and uh, for publication for their trials, a different type of uh, study. And uh, after 10 years, I just realize, or actually I want a change. I want to see how my work can directly impact on patient's life. And I can materialize those knowledge we accumulated in research. And at that time, Roche opens the biostats like a section. And so I applied and I'm one of the lucky one got hired. And I, since then I enjoyed my work every day. And my career path may be a little bit different. I came to Canada 20 years ago with no hireable like uh, skill, I will say, because I was uh, majored in international business, particularly specializing in Japanese. I landed in Toronto and there is nowhere I can practice my Japanese and find a job. So I went to went back to school, get my second, uh, tried to get my second degree in computer science without knowing what computer sciences actually mean. I started to teach you how to use Excel, how to use a word, then I can find a office job. But actually it was a hard mess. <laughs> and uh, that after a year, I sort of combined my computer science skill and maybe I, I thought that time I wasn't smart enough to be a crazy computer scientist. So I went to the statistics. And uh, after that, like with a undergraduate uh, computer science and the statistical combined degree, I was uh, struck a little bit to find myself where I want to work. I even went to a bank, right, branch. I want to be work on the front desk, but they told me my skill wasn't there looking for. I'm overqualified. And I went back to graduate school for my master and uh, for some theoretical statistics, I didn't enjoy it, but I started working my thesis. It's a, like a, a research project with clinicians. Immediately, I feel the click. I love it because there are real data I can touch and I can find the story. I can find the answer. And uh, after I, I mean, on the day I defense my master thesis, actually, my my supervisor hired me on site and uh, he didn't say you're a good statistician. He said, you have a common sense about data. You can communicate statistics with a non-statistician and uh, work with him because he is a professor in McMaster. He pushed me to take my PhD and uh, while I'm working full time, I took my PhD in biostats and uh, here I am, a statistician. And I think my story just to tell, what I want to tell you is if I can do it without knowing any science, then become a statistician and a data scientist, you can do it too. Thank you. Oh my gosh, what an amazing story. I mean, that's so, so, um, so powerful to, to hear that journey. All right. Next up, I have you, Melanie. You want to share some of your thoughts? Sure. Thanks, Donna. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to talk data sciences with us this evening, everyone. My name is Melanie Poulin Costello, and I'm um, I'm also a biostatistician uh, in uh, product development uh, in clinical trials uh, here at Roche. I guess um, 
when I think back about my career journey, I guess I, I didn't really know where I was going either when I was young, but, um, and, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm still young. Okay. Just so we all understand that, but, um, I really liked math and I was really good at it. And, um, and it seemed to me that a logical way to earn a living, if you really like math, is to do something with computers. So um, I, but then I discovered this thing called statistics when I was in my undergrad, and I thought this stuff is really cool. I like this. So um, I graduated from Waterloo uh, with uh, uh, both computer science and statistics, and then I heard about how people with degrees in statistics could help in clinical trials with drug development. And I just thought that was really cool. Um, I made my way to graduate school in statistics, um, also on Vancouver Island, like machine. Um, I got a bit adventurous and spent some time backpacking around Asia and teaching English in China and having babies and doing all kinds of exciting things with my life. And through a... Um, a network that I had maintained, um, I heard about uh, that Bayer was, you know, the aspirin company, um, that uh, they were looking for statisticians to fill a maternity leave, a contract position. And so I thought, okay, well, why don't I just give it a shot? And uh, I ended up working at Bayer as a clinical trial statistician for 10 years and learned a lot about uh, clinical trials there. I, I didn't even know what a clinical trial was when I started up there. Um, and uh, uh, I've also worked at Amgen. Um, and then I've been at Roche for um, a little over five years. Like Emmy said, um, uh, biostatistics is a global uh, function. We're actually about 200 biostatisticians globally within Roche. And um, the uh, company decided to open up biostatistics uh, at our Mississauga site about five years ago. And that's when Emmy and I joined. So very fortunate to also be at the right place at the right time. Um, my day job is uh, in solid tumor oncology. Um, and I get the opportunity to work with all kinds of data scientists, not just statisticians, uh, bioinformaticians, and particularly as we go down this route of trying to understand those targeted therapies for cancer treatment, biomarkers. And it's just blows my mind, all the different aspects that data science comes into play in terms of drug development and um, that opportunity that I have to indirectly or maybe directly in some cases contribute to um, the health of patients, cancer patients in, in particular. Uh, it's, it's great to come to work every day. So happy to share my story and thank you. Thank you so much, Mel. So we're going to pass the baton to Nita, which uh, I know also has a very interesting career journey. So I'll let, listen up. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I think when we were going to university, there was this sense that you had to have a five-year plan. And then there was a direct pathway, right? You, you put one step in front and then moved, uh, uh, you know, in a very systematic way to your goal, and that was considered success. And I think what you're hearing from my colleagues is that it, in real life, like all of you have experienced, it's not actually like that. Um, for me in particular, I, I feel like uh, my journey was life circumstances and then unexpected opportunities. And, um, you know, I couldn't have planned it in the way that it happened. Uh, nor would I have planned it um, to have such a to be able to have such a the outcome that I that I'm really pleased with. So um, I started my <clears throat> my career very early on, or at least uh, the experiences. Uh, I was um, I got a job in research in in a lab, hoping to go to medical school, which of course is an expected outcome for every Indian person that uh, that's there. Um, 
and before I applied to medical school, though I took a, a course in community health and realized that it was actually public health that I really, really enjoyed. And so I took, I had got a master's degree in uh, maternal and child health. After that, I was uh, looking for a job and was lucky enough actually to get one in, um, uh, in Washington DC or in Bethesda at the National Institute of Health in Allergies and Infectious Diseases. Um, that career was going quite nicely. And then I got married to a Canadian and moved to Canada. And all of a sudden there was no, what, what is a public health degree? And how do you use it? And what do you do with maternal and child health? <clears throat> and so I actually couldn't get a job for quite some time. Um, and uh, finally, <laughs> the job, a job was offered to me in a pharmaceutical company. And again, I had never thought that that would be something that I would have. Um, I've been with Roche for uh, 20 plus years um, and in country clinical operations uh, with Donna. And uh, it was, you know, again, uh, a breadth of experiences. I moved up through the organization, was the country head of uh, clinical operations for Canada and then regional head of um, clinical operations for the US and Canada, so uh, vice president of clinical operations. And then again, life circumstances happened in that there was uh, an organizational shift. And so the regions changed. And I was looking for the next opportunity it would have made perfect sense to stay in the development area. But actually I am now uh, an agile coach. Um, and what an agile coach does is is work with the organization, the leaders within the organization to kind of think about, um, about things a little bit differently. Really the mindset and behavior of, of looking at your work, um, being able to shift as the, as the circumstances shift. Uh, and I do a lot of uh, leadership development. And again, I wouldn't have predicted this but uh, extremely, extremely happy for where I am. Thanks so much, Nita. Uh, so as you can tell, I think from all of us, we all have uh, you know, differing career journeys, all right now in a common landing spot at Roche um, and all quite uh, enjoying our time there and, and how we fit into the overall organization. Uh, I'll maybe just uh, quickly share uh, a little bit of information about myself as well. Uh, I, like many of you, um, didn't know what a clinical trial was, what research was. When I finished my undergrad, I was honestly looking for a job just to pay off some of my student loans before I went back to do my master's. So I was able to get a job uh, similar to Fanny downtown. It was called Toronto General at the time. It hadn't amalgamated into the University Health Network. And I split my time. I spent half my time in the clinic. I was an EMG technologist. And then half my time, I was a uh, research coordinator uh, doing a lot of uh, data entry and assessments with, with individuals. Um, the, the physician that I worked for, we did movement uh, disorders and diabetic type of research. So um, again, didn't know anything about a trial, but certainly learned through that first job that I had at the hospital and actually really, really enjoyed this concept of um, you know, just the whole process of, of scientifically testing out, is it going to work? And all of the things that go into to a trial. Loved working with the various companies and Roche had always been one of the ones that we did research for. And I uh, made the leap of faith to move from the academic side into the pharmaceutical side and started uh, monitoring. That was my first job at Roche was monitoring clinical research. So similar to Nita had lots of different jobs. Um, and honestly, some of the jobs and pathways that uh, took me through would have never ever predicted um, where I landed. Um, but again, just kind of an openness for trying something different and filling in gaps and needs where the company needed you and, and really just having that flexible mindset. 
So I ventured into uh, more of the rural data science uh, aspect, probably in the last kind of six to eight years. And uh, again, I think a lot of us are starting to see this evolution of the importance of how rural data could truly be harnessed. So the value of, of data that's currently untapped and how that can really help us understand, not only for us as a pharma company, how our products actually work in people, but just overall in you know, how we leverage populational health, how can we help um, with you know, healthcare system efficiency, um, and, and again, just making sure that as many patients as possible are benefiting and, and getting um, the appropriate care that they need. So it's definitely been a, a journey that despite my five-year plan, none of my plans <laughs> actually came to fruition, um, but it, it truly um, has been, again, trying to uh, take the opportunities as they come and um, learn from what I can. So I'm gonna maybe um, start asking a series of questions. And um, if you guys have additional questions as we're talking, throw them into the chat. We can also do Q and A at the end, but if there's something that, some, you know, that resonates or you want to kind of deep dive, just let us know. Um, but the first question I'm gonna throw out and this one, I'm gonna start with you, Nasheen. You kind of touched on it when you did your intro. Um, what is it about data science? What is it that really interests you? And how did you kind of, um, you know, what clicked? I think we've heard that from a few different people that sometimes things just resonate. So when you're doing your job, what do you love about it? So um, I don't actually have a programming background. Um, I'm teaching myself R programming at the moment. So that's, that's kind of like a hobby what I'm doing. Um, my part of the job is, um, data collection, data quality, data strategy, and data delivery. So we use standards in our clinical trials um, to collect the best quality of data. Years ago, it would be about what was the primary use of the data from the clinical trials. But now I'm actually doing research. So it, it, the data that we collect and that we've collected over the years, it has so many other uses, secondary use. Um, and, uh, you know, you can use analysis on it for further discovery, for further insight. And I always wanted to be in research. And this type of research really appeals to me much more than what I was experiencing in the lab. Um, and I also really love science. So I was a bit of a science nerd at school. I did used to say to myself very ambitiously as a child that I would find the cure to cancer. Well, <laughs> I think uh, that's not going to be the case, but I have uh, been working on cancer trials. So um, I've been in this field for many, many years, but my skills have constantly been evolving as the technology advances, as the, as as this industry advances, this discipline advances, I move along with it. And so I find that I'm actually uh, always learning. I've always got growth um, and it doesn't have to be this particular industry. It doesn't have to be the pharmaceutical industry. From what I'm seeing, it's happening in every industry, whether it's finance, retail, the automobile industry, data science is just such a powerful tool. And I wanna be there at the cutting edge um, while these discoveries are being made. So that, that's how I feel about it at the moment. Donna, you're on mute. See, Sorry. there I go. Yeah, keep, keep calling, calling me out. Thank you so much. Um, wanted to, to pass the baton to you, Mel, with kind of a similar question. What is it in your current role or even some of your future interests? Um, what's your passion? What are the things that you really enjoy doing? Wow, we could be here all night talking. Like if, <laughs> you know, think about that thing that can keep you up all night talking right this is this is one of the things and you know when you go to a party and you tell someone you're a statistician they they totally zone out and <laughs> go the other way but anyways thank you for listening to my passion <laughs> um I guess for me personally right like it, like I said earlier I, I like math uh, I like puzzles I like logic and so in drug development, it's a very cross-functional collaborative uh, experience. And um, there's the clinical trial, 
there's, you know, the Roche drug that you're trying to understand if it works, how it works, is it safe? Uh, but there's also the competitive landscape. What's What are our competitors up to? There's uh, the physicians who treat the patients. What, what do these patients actually need? Um, does this, you know, if this is an IV drug versus a, a tablet, what, you know, how does that impact the patient? Lots of those types of questions. So there's there's so many pieces that need to come together to decision making in clinical trials, and um, and 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 we're all human, and humans are messy. So you know you have um, you have lots of opinions, and you have lots of ideas from really really smart people. So you get on a call like this, and ideas and opinions are going around, and smart people are answering hard questions to help us understand everything. And I guess the part that I like, the, the role that I play as a statistician and as a data science is to bring that element of logic and hopefully objectivity. We all have our unconscious biases, but, but as a statistician and data science to say, okay, well, what does the data say? How is the data speaking to us? What's the evidence? Um, and uh, uh, just bringing that in as part of the equation um, as we have those discussions about, you know, the results from a clinical trial are not always clear. I would say they often live in that gray zone where it's not, easy to decide whether or not the drug works, is safe, is the right fit for the patient, all of those questions. So to bring that logic to the table, to listen and try and understand, you know, my cross-functional colleagues input, it's all of that together that is so dynamic. And, and, uh, that, and once you kind of figure it out for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, then there's a readout for prostate cancer and I have to learn all over again. So it's, it's, it's so dynamic. It's a lot of fun. And I'll, I'm going to stop talking or I just won't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's clear that uh, your passion is coming through Mel. So that's amazing. Awesome. All right. I'm going to throw a different question. Um, and I'm going to throw this one to you, uh, Nita. And it's around what have some of the challenges been that you've faced? So throughout your career journey, you can choose um, where you'd like to focus, but um, maybe one or two or so, and, and how you tried to overcome or work through that particular challenge. You know, I think that there have been some external challenges, but I will tell you probably the biggest challenge was my belief in myself. It was my sense of, am I good enough? Do I really know enough? Can I try for that? Um, and, and these self-limiting beliefs, I think. Uh, there, there's so much more that we can do. And uh, I see in the Q&A, one of the questions is about transferable skills. And I think that's the thing that no matter what experience you've had, you learn something from it. It, it uh, deepens your understanding of life, of, of some aspect of um, the conversation. And so I would say that that was probably the, the biggest hurdle. And um, it, I, uh, even now I try often when something really, really scares me um, my first instinct is to kind of pull away. And then the other instinct says, give it a try. And you know what? Again, it feels really big. It feels like, oh, I'm going to be embarrassed or I'm going to look bad or I'm not going to know what to do in that moment. Um, but it doesn't actually really have a, a major impact. So I would, I would say that that for me has been probably my biggest growth and learning is have faith. Great, there we go. Um, so maybe just continue on that um, question that started around the transferable skills. Fanny, I'm gonna pass this to you because I know that you have been busy building a brand new team over the course of the last year. So 
you know, yes, there's the technical kind of pieces, but what are the, I would say like more mindsets, behaviors, that aspect, what do you look for when you're trying to kind of build, especially in, in a, a newer, I guess, innovative field that you're supporting right now? I think from a transferable skill uh, set that I look for are people who are within a growth mindset, people who are always open to learning new things and having this ability to be vulnerable in situations such that they can say, you know what, I don't understand that part. Can you explain it to me? I know this part. This part I don't know so much. So why don't we work together? Why don't we complement each other instead of you know, competing with each other at times, right? And, and I, I think that type of us versus me mentality is, is something that is propelling the most lucrative and progressive projects and organizations forward. I think the other thing to consider is common language. I, I, I find that at times, no matter what organization you go to, there's a certain level or a type of speak and when we're talking to different people and we know that there are so many different disciplines or market sectors that are important to convene and engage in order for the health system to become efficient and effective, the ability for us to speak in a way that's tangible, that's relatable, that is, is easy for people to understand and hold on to really determines whether or not we will progress. And, and we see it all the time, and, and this is sort of just an anecdote, but go to some data science um, conferences. Let me preface, I, I love data science, but <laughs> there's some conferences you go to and it's just highly, highly technical language. And, and then you go to another conference and it's very clinically focused, but the world's need to intersect in order for us to bring some of that brilliance into the market for consumption and for the use by patients, healthcare providers in the system. So what I would say is just practice, simple, 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 common language and being able to, to be that translator between different sectors and different markets. That's awesome. Now I'm going to uh, bring Emmy into the conversation because I know when you did your intro, Emmy, you were actually highlighting that one of the strengths that um, came from was your ability to, to speak statistics in a non-statistical way that you were able to, to make sense of the data. So curious to hear your perspectives on um, you know within your field, what are, again, some of those like um, core skills or things that have really helped you succeed? Yeah, thank you, Donna, for this question. Uh, I think the first skill I will say is talk statistic without using formula. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's uh, like daily work, we, I work or our team, data sciences team, work with cross-functional teams, including clinicians, the biomarker scientists, the regulatory, medical writer, all of the team members, they don't need no formula, but they need to know the logic behind it. And you, you need to be able to clearly communicate a sort of like a mysterious, mysterious, like a concept with a long formula in simple language. And that's the way then I will say communication is a key to work in a, a collaborative way with uh, all the smart people from uh, all over the world in the organization. And uh, another is uh, collaboration and uh, you need to build up uh, like uh, your network and uh, to be able to know when you need help, obviously you won't know everything, who you can reach out to seek advice, to get the help and uh, then bring that to back to the team to make the important uh, contribution. I, there's many other skills, but I will leave that to my colleagues. Awesome. 
Thank you, Emmy. So definitely hearing some themes around communication, teamwork, that open-mindedness, trying new skills, growth. So uh, thank you guys for so far a really rich conversation. Um, so I'm gonna maybe uh, pitch the next question to you, Nasheen. And it's really around, um, you know, we talked about some of the challenges that people have faced. I'm actually gonna flip it and ask, what have been some of the opportunities or unexpected surprises? So things that you didn't necessarily uh, plan for, but perhaps they happened. Um, so one of the um, experiences that I've never forgotten is actually early in my career when I worked for GlaxoSmithKline, I approached my manager and uh, I was doing, I was doing um, clinical data management um, in a phase one trial over there, but we didn't do international trials at that point. So it, it, it wasn't something that was happening, but I asked for the opportunity. So I said, if we ever did international trials, would you please consider me? And I think about six months to a year later, we had a suite of um, six trials being conducted in Beijing, China. And my manager remembered what I said. And so it came my way and it was absolutely um, at that time, um, something very unusual. Um, I got to travel to Beijing. I got to meet my colleagues in China, and it was it was such an amazing growth opportunity because I asked for something that didn't actually even exist at the time. And then there's been a few cases in when I've been working at Roche where I've been asked, you know, to help out on a short term assignment, something that's very short but urgent in duration. Um, uh, basically, you know, just to on, on projects that have come in, but they haven't been established or they're very ambiguous. And so I've said yes to those opportunities and they've led to, to amazing, quite big um, projects that have ended up in drug filing. So because I was there from the beginning and I said, yes, I'll, I'll help out. Um, I managed to get into some really, really wonderful opportunities that were very rewarding because they had a huge impact on the patient population. Um, and then the other thing is um, I've been working on an initiative with other sponsors, with other companies uh, outside of Roche, which has also been um, a wonderful opportunity to learn from other leaders in the industry and just see the bigger picture. So sometimes it's just a case of putting yourself out there. As Nita said, I do have to do a lot of self-talk and not overthink things and just grab the opportunities when they come because um, if I gave myself too much time, I'd probably talk myself out of doing many of them. Um, but, but they've been wonderful and I'll, I'll never forget any of them. I think they've really shaped who I am today. Amazing, thank you for sharing. I'm gonna ask the same question of you, Melanie. Anything come to mind through your adventures around uh, perhaps opportunities or things that uh, certainly hadn't been part of the, the master plan? For sure, thanks Donna. I, uh, yeah, a lot of what Nusheen talked about resonated with me in terms of, of, you know, say yes and then figure it out and, it's, and you'll be surprised and amazed at what will happen. Um, I think that I, um, I, I, I think I underestimated what it means to maintain a network. Um, and when I look back and how so much of my opportunities for, um, moving from Bayer to Amgen, from Amgen to Roche, and then internally getting involved in different projects here at Roche is, um, it's it's about having a network of people who have uh, their hand on your back, who you can just ask the question, hey, I'm really interested in, in doing this. Do you, do you know anybody who's doing this and how can I get involved? And so um, just maintaining that network, I think has, has um, always amazed me that when you go out and ask, people who maybe you don't even really know that well, but uh, you just ask the question, kind of, you know, take a deep breath and find the courage. Uh, it's amazing how you can get connected. Um, and so uh, I wouldn't be here today where I am if it wasn't for uh, those 
people around me pointing me in the right direction or uh, willing to take a chance on me or um, in many cases, you know, speaking up for me and advocating for me too. So yeah. thanks. Thank you. Um, so uh, the next kind of piece I'm going to maybe touch upon is uh, just, I guess, the the joy of juggling. Um, so a lot of us have families, we work full time, we have aging parents, there's always a gazillion things that make up everybody's life. So I'm going to um, start with you, um, Nita, to maybe just share some um, thoughts around how you find the balance or what were some of the, whether experiences good or bad, in trying to, to, to juggle a full-time career, perhaps with uh, a lot of personal um, things that still have to, to be fit into a, a, a day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is the reality of the situation. Um, most of my career, I've traveled quite a bit. And once I became a regional head, I was probably out of the, the home, uh, I would say two weeks out of four, and my kids were still relatively young. And um, there was, there were absolutely times uh, when I was questioning my own sanity as well as whether I was doing the right thing for my family. Um, you know, I, I remember a particular story where I was, had been traveling pretty much nonstop and, um, and my daughter, uh, I was actually in Europe and she called and she said, oh, I just made it to the next level of the speech competition and you're gonna be there, right, mom? And I looked and I saw that I in fact was not going to be there. And so I said, no. And then she, you know, she started crying and she said, oh, it's okay. And at that moment, I just realized, you know, what was important. So I canceled that meeting so that I would be there. And I think it's um, part of it is, is that it's not, it's not perfect. It's never perfect. Uh, and not to have that expectation, but to not allow things to, you know, to fall to the ground either. You have to remember what's important. Um, you know, I thought it was such a big deal that I wasn't going to be there for that important meeting. But when I told people, they were like, oh, okay. Um, so part of it is not expecting myself to be perfect. I, you know, my kids didn't always come home. In fact, they never came home to cookies and to, you know, pies and those kinds of things. Um, I never made the, the Halloween costumes that other mothers were making. And so I, uh, I had to, I had to be okay with that. Um, and now I'm proud to say that my daughter is older. And um, she sees me as a great role model of somebody who can manage the two and that you don't have to be, you know, the perfect mother, the perfect wife, the perfect, you know, the perfect employee. Um, so I would say we all muddle through it, uh, but we always have to remember what is important um, at, that, at that moment and, and uh, focus on that when that's necessary. Amazing reflections. I'll be honest, I had the opposite happen for me. And my daughter still tells me to this day, she remembers that uh, I was traveling and uh, stuck at an airport, the Nutley Airport, and it's historically never on time. So my flight was late, I couldn't get home. She was five at the time and it was her first Christmas concert. And I missed it. And to this day, she still reminds me, you weren't there. So it is tough to sometimes, despite your best intentions, uh, sometimes it's not perfect. Awesome. So maybe, Emmy, any reflections on this particular topic on, um, you know, some of the coping mechanisms and, and uh, how you manage? Yeah, I, I think getting me through some difficulties is always think a positive thing, a positive side. And there, the difficulties will be temporary, but uh, after you went through those temporary difficulties, they will be 
always a bright side waiting for you. Like one of the story was like a couple of years ago, like uh, I remember was in the summer, like. Uh, then my mother-in-law was diagnosed with lung cancer. So my husband scheduled the meeting, fly back to China to visit her. Then suddenly I received a request said, you need to go to Europe for the EMA, the uh, European like, Medical Agency to defend your trial because the lead statistician could get visa. And uh, that was uh, totally unexpected. And uh, I have said, okay, my, I have a grade two, like eight years, seven years old at home. And then what I can do, I have a, a high schooler, that's okay, she can manage, but I couldn't leave a seven years old at home. And we don't have a family, close family or relative can take care of. So I was thinking, okay, whatever, I will bring my eight years old, seven years old, go with me, I will bring the high schooler as a babysitter. When I'm in the meeting, she can babysit in the hotel. So we made it and uh, three of us took a trip actually to find our big trial <laughs> in Europe. And uh, after that, we have a, a little tour in Amsterdam and around the other cities and actually it was a, such a memorable like moment until now my daughter always bragging right I was in Amsterdam I was in there I was in here and at that time it's almost uh, like uh, unthinkable right <laughs> and now I would just so appreciate those opportunity actually turn to a such positive experience for my daughters. Such a great story. Thank you for sharing. I know that we've got a few questions coming in the Q&A, so keep them coming. I'm going to circle back. Uh, I just have uh, one more series of questions, and then we're going to um, flip into some of the questions that you guys are raising. So the next one, uh, Fanny, I'm going to direct to you. And it's along the lines of, you know, what are some of the things that have helped you succeed or what are some of the support mechanisms that have really helped you get you to where you are today? So any reflections on either of those spots? Yeah, I, actually, I was thinking about it because um, of what Nita had said earlier, it really triggered something. There's this, this roadmap that you have in your head when you're in your younger years of what you're supposed to be doing. And it's very much influenced by the people around you because they have decided that there's this perfect formula that's gonna get you to this level of happiness. And then when you realize that some of that plan doesn't work out, you're sort of in this place of distraught and you feel like you don't know where you're going, where you're headed, your plan is broken and you start embracing your life for the opportunities that come forward to you. And it's about not pigeonholing yourself into any specific role or title or job or area. It's about being able to embrace who you are in that moment, what you wanna learn and the opportunities that are around you. And I find when you, sounds a little bit spiritual, it kind of is, but I found that I was the most happiest when I followed those paths as opposed to the ones that I preconceived in my head. Because if you asked me what kind of jobs there were today, maybe 20 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to tell you because the world has completely changed. So I, I would say embrace your surroundings. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to ask the same question of Hugh Nasheen. Any thoughts around, um, you know, what you feel has helped you succeed? Any um, coping mechanisms, support infrastructure, anything along those lines? Um, so for me, um, it's really about my relationships, um, both professional and personal. Um, I, I put a lot of effort and time in nurturing my relationships, in building um, what I call authentic 
um, relationships full of trust and respect, um, especially at work, the teams I'm working with, um, I want I want the environment to be safe so that we can have open communication, um, feel, feel and say what we need to say without any fear of repercussions. Um, it's and, and have that environment where communication is open. So I do invest a lot of time in relationships, um, uh, a lot of, you know, deep connections. I don't need lots of people. I just need very deep enriching relationships. And that has been my support network, both at home and work. Um, and then the other thing is, um, there are some aspects of my job I must do as part of the role, but there are others, many others where I have a choice. So I've learned to look at my bandwidth and my capacity. What can I do with everything that's going on now and be okay with saying, no, I can't take this on. Or if I take this on, what am I going to let go? Um, so it, it, it work-life balance is very important to me because, um, you know, I prioritize my health um, and um, my mental health as well. So, um, and keeping things in perspective, when I was younger, if anything went wrong or any failure occurred, you know, it felt like the entire world was collapsing on me and it was all my fault. Well, I've, I've learned to be okay with things going wrong now. I've learned to be okay that, you know, not everything is going to go the way I planned and that's okay because a lot of things did go the way I planned and, um, I learn a lot through the things that don't go right. There's lessons learned. There's things we can share and do better next time. It's, it's not the end of the world. So my perspective, my mindset is very important um, in terms of how I succeed um, and how I move forward. Um, and that, I think that's made it very enjoyable for me when I work with teams. I really um, feel that deep connection with. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're gonna maybe uh, tackle some of the questions that are coming through and I'll, you know, I still have a few more questions, but let's maybe shift. Um, so I know there's a couple questions or themes around, you know, what's a typical day? Um, how do I get started? I feel like all of us come from very different backgrounds, so we pro could probably give you each a typical day. Um, but I'm gonna maybe start with you, Mel, if you want to talk about a typical day from a, a stats lens, perhaps, uh, or pick whichever lens you want, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of lenses to choose from, that's for sure. Um, I, I guess when I, when I hear that question, I'm, I'm inclined to say that there isn't a typical day. Um, as a statistician in clinical trials, a clinical trial takes many years. So, um, and, you know, as a statistician, you might, you might not you'll move in and out of clinical trials. You might not be on the same clinical trial for the whole duration of the trial, right? So I guess um, maybe what's typical about the day is uh, around communication, uh, cross-functional communication. Um, and then uh, on the other side, there's that heads down getting work done. Um, and so as a statistician, you're, you're always on a cross-functional team. There's always questions and problems to solve and meetings to attend, and you know, doing it like this, we don't even get any muffins. I don't know, that's no fun, but <laughs> the, so uh, communication, but then that the part that another part I really enjoy about being a data scientist is that you get, it's just me and my laptop, right? So whether that's uh, doing some coding, whether that's looking at some data, whether that's reading uh, publications to understand the disease area, whatever that is, it's that quiet time where I'm, um, you know, just heads down working. So um, I think that the tasks themselves really vary and differ depending on which project you're focused on on that day. Um, but those two elements of, uh, and, and some days it's, it's all just communication and meetings and answering questions and asking questions. Um, 
But I think on a weekly basis, there's time where uh, you have to take that heads down time uh, because that work is just as important, sometimes maybe more important. So um, uh, other than that, uh, uh, a typical day for a statistician, I think also, <sighs> It involves kind of being the bad guy because, <laughs> oh gosh, how do I explain this? So lots of times you get so excited about your data or so excited about the prospect of having a new medicine to help patients. And then the statistician comes along and tells you, oh, okay, that's nice, but you have to pay attention to these issues over here or you need to increase your number of patients and then it becomes unaffordable. And so it, there's an element there of, um, you gotta have some thick skin to be a statistician. You have to be able to stand up and speak the truth um, and bring that objectivity to the table. Um, I think that that is probably almost on a daily basis as the statistician coming and, and just speaking up and, we, all, we often like to talk about how as statisticians, we need to push back um, because we need to, we need logic to prevail. So. <laughs> Love it. And you're a very nice bad cop. I, I, I quite enjoy it. <laughs> so maybe Fanny, I'm gonna also ask this of you because you work in a, a different aspect of the Roche organization where it's really more around, um, you know, the, the innovative new technologies and how that perhaps will integrate into our operating models and our business opportunities. So maybe a few thoughts from your perspective. And I know if there's not a typical day, but things that you might want to highlight. I think something that's inherent in the innovation sector in general is that part of your role is to create a certain level of friction in the organization. And it, it's part of your job to have people think about new situations that they may not have already encountered or new paths or new ideas that may seem so far from the actual day-to-day -day of things. And that's not always an easy conversation to have. I mean, there are people who embrace new ideas and the possibilities and the optimism but then there are people who are also, you know, trying to be realistic about things and, and what is actually implementable. And so there's always this push and pull between what could be and what is. And I think it's that uh, you need a certain amount of resilience to be the first one out, to be the one who champions an idea that many people may not understand or or have yet to fully be educated about and that that just takes time but it, it doesn't always feel good it, it feels good after right like when things kind of finish and and you can point to it and and you know it's like wow look at look at what we did like look at how we were able to propel and 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 realize some of those those amazing visions that we have but um you do have to practice the thick skin and the resilience, and you do have to fight for what you think is good for the system. Okay, so um, I'm going to go into the, the next couple, and I, if, if I'm reading through the q and I think there's some themes around how do you break into you know, first job, first career, where you may or may not have a ton of experience. So, you know, seeing this one around, um, you know, I want to become a data scientist, how should I get started? And then another question around, what should I be focusing on if I want to get into this field? So, again, I think a lot of this come from diverse um, uh, career journeys and things like that. So we probably have different perspectives. So I'm going to start with you, Emmy. Any early thoughts on uh, if you were going to give advice on kind of getting that first step in, what would you suggest would be things that a, an individual could focus on? Yes, that's a good question. I'm just thinking about uh, how I started and uh, as an uh, uh, immigrant and uh, 
cannot speak perfect English at that time and uh, still now the same. And how I started, actually, I think is take any opportunity to get experience. I started with a job with a, a professor in McMaster just as a, a summer student. And a lot of my, my classmates won't take it because it's a last minute opportunity. There's no funding, it's really low paid. I think I basically took $10 an hour at that time, and they thought I made a bad decision. Actually, that summer student just keep going, turned to a full-time employee, McMaster University, then made me met a lot of, a lot of like uh, researchers down the road. They just want to work with me, just all because of I took that low paid, almost one tier student position. So if you happen to have a, a first experience here at a state scientist, particularly if you don't have any Canadian experience, that's uh, to, be, to be honest, that's uh, important to knock the door, then take some like uh, any opportunity you can grab. Even I know a lot of my classmates, they started as uh, a intern or they start to, as a volunteer in some organization to use their skill to make impactful changes. And uh, that will open your door to a lot of organizations, make you meet the right people. And uh, that's uh, will be the important first step. Donna, I wonder if I could jump in here just to emphasize <laughs> Emmy's point, because I, I, I just think it's brilliant. Um, again, a lot of times we think we need to come through the front door. You know, it has to have, oh, if I want to be a data scientist, I have to apply for data scientist jobs. And really, it's these side doors that probably allow us to get entry into an organization and then allow us to see if actually do we want to be data scientists or are we happy with the surprise experience of wherever we are and want us to move there. Um, so I, I would say that, you know, an experience that is similar to, um, that allows you to have enough to be able to speak and bring value to the organization and then, uh, and then it's easier once you're inside an organization to move around within the organization than try, try to get exactly the, the position that you want. And then the other, I know it's not always financially possible, but you know, even volunteering in some ways or in um, to, to create those networks um, are really important. Awesome. Thank you, Nita. I was totally going to actually ask, so I'm glad that you jumped in. So uh, appreciate it. Any other thoughts or considerations from the group on this particular topic? Because again, I know all of us have very different journeys and how we transitioned from um, either, you know, school, undergrad, academia, what have you. So anybody else want to share any thoughts on this one? No. Donna, maybe I'll just say that it that there is an element where, um, particularly uh, with statistics, where you do need a certain type of education. Um, and I think to Emmy's point too, maybe taking those opportunities to upskill. So um, whether that's like you know Nishine is teaching herself how to code in R. Um, and, uh, you know, a statistician working on clinical trials, you, you need to have a master's degree in statistics. So I just say that just, you know, in terms of, of realistic expectations, and I agree that there's many ways that you can um, get in, and maybe you decide, like several of our data scientists have here at Roche, that you'll go to school while you're working at Roche. And, um, and get your master's or PhD in statistics while you're working as a data scientist in another capacity. So there's just there's a lot of options. Education is often a requirement, but there's lots of options for the education piece too. 
Yeah, and I can maybe um, add on to that, Mel. So kind of in my arena, um, it's it's similar. There is a minimum level of education. So whether it's uh, you know a master's of epidemiology or public health or those types of study, uh, those types of degrees are usually what would be um, required. But I can tell you within our department, we have. I think two people going to school right now to upskill and, and complete those degrees. We have other folks um, that again, that have master's degrees in other things. So um, we try to divvy the work up where the skill set makes sense. So we have tried to adopt a team approach. So if we have people that are strong in the study design piece, um, we leverage other people who might be stronger more in the strategy and communications piece as an example. So um, there's always, you know, flexibility, but I think it's a great call out, Mel, that um, there's usually some level of education, but um, uh, I think we've all highlighted in addition to that kind of foundational knowledge, there's lots of other things that come into play for, for getting that uh, foot in the door. I just wanted to add something. So when I made my transition from the lab to, to um, a, a CRO, it was a small CRO. So they were a little bit more flexible in the skills that they were willing to take. Um, and I obviously took a, a, a salary cut to make that trans that lateral move into a different area. But there, there could be like... Um, uh, Emmy said there could be some smaller opportunities for smaller companies who who might be a little bit more flexible and getting you through the door and getting some experience because that first opportunity that I got helped me to get into a much bigger company later on and I also even took a five-year career break to raise my children and was very rusty but there was a company out there that saw my potential and the my employment history and they took me back on so sometimes there are companies Companies that are willing to open the door for you to start maybe you have to start at the bottom before you can move where you want to be and that was my goal just come in at the bottom open the door and see where I could land so I, it's not impossible because we're here in front of you showing you that we can be done thank you so much Nasheen all right um so uh, just again, flipping through the Q&A. Um, so picking up, there's one question I think I'm going to have to defer. So uh, one question around explaining our IT program at Roche, and I'm not an IT expert, <laughs> but I can definitely um, take that one back and try and get a little bit of uh, additional context on, again, IT can be a pretty broad term, so we have a lot of things under that function, but we can certainly provide a little bit more detail as a follow-up. So maybe Ashley, I can work with you um, to provide some additional context. So I feel like I'm gonna have to, to hold on that one. Um, and the next one down uh, is, you know, what are common titles for entry-level roles? So if I'm aiming for data scientist, what could be typical entry roles that I could be looking for? So I feel like this might also be a good of a, a group discussion because I think we are all coming from different aspects of the organization and we're only one aspect, right? We're in the healthcare sector. There's a gazillion other sectors that a data scientist skills could be leveraged, but we can certainly take a crack at um, uh, a healthcare perspective within the pharma. So I'm gonna maybe start with you, Mel. Uh, any early thoughts on typical or, um, you know, uh, job IDs that people could look out for? Um, I, I guess my first reaction is don't get too hung up on the title, right? Like if they're asking for a VP or a principal or a senior, like that's probably a good indicator that that's not an entry level position. Um, uh, just the title of data scientist might be a good place to start. Um, and then uh, I guess I would encourage you to, you know, read the job description that's posted 
do some investigation, use your network, talk to people. Hey, do you know anything about company Roche that's doing X and um, go for it. I mean, uh, if it's not an entry level position and that's what you're looking for, maybe your resume will get noticed. I don't think there's any rules about, oh, I can't apply to this because I, 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 I think I don't qualify. I mean, Nita already spoke to that, right? You, you, we can be our own worst enemy. So even something that maybe seems a bit of a stretch, just go for it. Put, your, put yourself out there. Um, connect your network. Talk to people. Uh, upload your resume. <laughs> um, uh, and read that job description, look for, you know, skills that, um, that you have that, you know, a data scientist, it's often going to be something like R programming or data management, you know, look for those skills, but also look for maybe skills that are transferable. Maybe, maybe you haven't worked in the pharmaceutical industry before, but you have, um, you, you know, other skills that, that you would want to highlight. So think wisely about how you highlight those in your resume or, um, uh, you know, any opportunity you have in terms of conversations or, or um, what you share on LinkedIn and just, I would say, go for it. Awesome. Donna, I wonder if I could jump in, in here again. Um, studies show that women feel like they have to check off every single box on a job uh, description in order to apply. And where men are like, yeah, it's nice to have, I'll have some stuff and I won't have some stuff and you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, I think what Melanie talked about, education, and if there's a minimum required education, you have to follow those things. That That is, and if there are some required skills, you can't get around those. But if you have the minimum education, but you don't have every aspect of what they've talked about that they want, it's our wish list as, a, as an organization. You know, if we could have somebody that has everything, wow. But rarely does somebody do that, uh, fill every everything. So look for those minimum requirements. If you're not sure, ask what the minimum requirements are. Um, and the other parts, if you don't have all of them, as Melanie said, really use the transferable skills to say, I don't have this, but I have this that I think was quite complimentary, or you didn't you know, ask for this, but I think this is a value that I can bring uh, to, the, uh, to the organization. So again, um, kind of go out there with, with some confidence that you have something to offer, but balance it with, with the real um, clarity of what is a basic entry requirement. Yeah, I was just Thank gonna, you. sorry, I was just gonna add to that, that um, uh, what Nita said, the minimum requirements are obviously required, but companies are also looking at your potential. They're looking at what you could actually achieve your growth. So if you can show that when you go for an interview or um, you know, when you're having a, a discussion, that's what they, they're looking to, because they wanna see how much you can grow in your potential as well. And it's, it's a good idea to have some introspection of, about yourself and, and see what you've achieved and what you wanna do in your passions and let that come out. Love it. Thank you so much, Nasheen. I think we're all um, you know, saying it's, it's really tough to just nail down typical role titles. Because uh, even within our company across the organization, we have multiple job descriptions and um, uh, roles that have a lot of similar types of capabilities and, and competencies, and we're just one of many companies. So uh, I think, uh, you know, highlighting kind of, again, those core minimum requirements and, uh, you know, doing your due diligence and, again, just putting yourself out there are really kind of recommendations that I think all of us are, are highlighting. Um, I'm gonna maybe pause for some of the questions. I think we've hit most of them, um, but again, please continue to, to, to add in. And I wanted to, to ask the, the team again, we can figure out uh, who would like to take the lead on um, 
anybody who's experienced or challenged barriers because you're a woman. So if you think throughout your career, uh, has that posed a challenge or has it been an opportunity? So just curious on reflections of, uh, again, perhaps um, being in a, a space that perhaps traditionally has been more dominated by, by males, but I know certainly in Roche, that's not the case. We have a very diverse and, and healthy um, number of amazing women, but wanted to pose the question um, more from a historical perspective with your career journeys. So maybe Fanny, I'm going to start with you. Any thoughts? Lots of thoughts, lots of stories. I, I, I think since the beginning of my career, that's always been a coefficient to anything that I bring for better or for worse. And in some ways it worked for me and in some ways it didn't. And, you know, I went from trying to make myself look more mature, you know, wearing pearls and brooches and more conservative outfits to, to being somebody who would potentially lower their voice or use different tones in order to ensure that they were being taken seriously. So, I mean, I guess what I've gone through is just a series of learning experiences and and me trying to cope and navigate accordingly. I think at the end of the day, you know, your work will show for itself, but also um, it's important to speak up in, in specific forums, even when you feel like you may not be well received or you may not be received the way that you want to. You may not have the presence that other people may have. So I think there's lots of different, lots of different events in my life, and those are the lessons that I've I've learned. And I think, you know, it it makes you stronger. It really, really does. And it it empowers you as a person to to be the person you want to be and to be the person that you can be proud of at the end of the day. So yeah, lots of stories. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Fanny. Uh, Emmy, any reflections on this particular topic from your perspective? Yes, uh, I, I really resonate with uh, what Nita said at the beginning. Like uh, for me, it's those uh, self-doubt. Like uh, I always, if there's anything one wrong, I will see, yeah, it might be my fault, right? And uh, also try to be a people pleaser. And because uh, as a mother or wife at a house, you always want to make peace. And, uh, but uh, through the five years in Rosh, I learned a lot how to be confident, how to challenge myself. I remembered, like uh, Melanie actually was my manager, like when I was in oncology program, she used to tell me, fake it until you make it. Without knowing the history of uh, English, uh, like uh, pop song, I didn't know where that come from. I use it with all my team members, right? I encourage them fake it until you make it, until one day some, I, I would say Melanie told me this, and one day somebody had to correct me, no, that's from a song, <laughs> who are the singers? <laughs> I have to Google it, but that tell, tells a lot about me. I self-doubt sometimes, but I use encouragement from my colleagues, from my manager, from my mentor, and to conquer the barrier, to be confident. I love it. I'm going to de definitely remember that phrase now with, uh, with you in mind, Emmy, for sure. Nasheen, anything that you wanted to add on this particular topic? Sorry, <laughs> I double muted myself there. Um, I, I, I think um, what Nita and Emmy said resonates with me more than other people creating barriers. I've probably created my own <laughs> because I've doubted my own ability. And like I said, um, I'm pretty analytical and I overthink a situation <laughs> quite a bit. So um, what I've done in the past is I've actually found an ally 
an advocate, a mentee, a coach to bounce off, um, you know, what I'm thinking to, to almost show, them, show me the mirror and say, um, you know, why are you going down this direction of thought? What's behind it? What's stopping you from trying this? Um, which I found has been very beneficial for me because um, sometimes you don't realize how much you limit yourself and you confine yourself um, to a particular space. So that's that's really helped me more, more in trying to come out of limiting myself and realizing my own potential um, and, and you know seeking those opportunities and just saying yes. Um, the worst case scenario is it doesn't go according to plan, but you'll learn something from it, probably more than if it did go according to plan. So um, I, I've done a lot of work on myself and what I call myself critic, <laughs> taming that voice. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what I'd say. Awesome. I definitely feel like this group is uh, highlighting sometimes we're our biggest critic and challenger. Um, and trying to overcome that and uh, yeah, find, find that path forward. Um, so I have a few more questions around, um, you know, if we have, you know, pieces of advice that each of us might give uh, that type of thing. If anybody has additional questions that you would like to raise, uh, please, again, um, do not hesitate. And of course, my dog decides to pop in, um, but maybe, uh, um another question fanny thank you for raising it um let's maybe talk about future proofing so we've talked a lot about kind of current state and what we're doing typical day in the life that type of thing but uh, maybe let's do some crystal balling and think about how we can set ourselves up for the future uh job whatever that might be and i know certainly here at roche um you know the evolution of the healthcare system and, and how data technology um, can, can really have improvements uh, is that keeps us up at night and we do a lot of kind of uh, you know forecasting and, and consideration so Benny I'm going to start with you what are some thoughts around that particular topic I think um, it, it's part of the reason why I posed the question is because I think it's a super interesting question. Um, it's it's one where all the traditional titles and roles are starting to melt away, and there's all these new types of jobs that are coming up, and you have to take into consideration all of the things that are changing in the world. There's this huge uh, availability of content at our fingertips every day. Right, so it's no longer what you know because everybody has access to the same information. And then you have this emergence of technology and people's visibility to new technologies and access to new technologies. So, you know, what, where does the person now claim value in, in the workforce? It's maybe the ability to, to use technology, to be able to mesh technology with new content, to be able to refine things like, we talk about decision engines, right? And, and they send out certain outputs, but then maybe the new job is to be able to triage and say, hey, this, this is a really uh, viable output, but this, this is kind of nonsense. So it doesn't make any sense. So it's, it's not so much the coder that I see anymore. It's, it's sort of the synthesizer of all of this information. So I think that would be a good thing to think about moving into the future. Love it for sure. It's kind of making sense of all of the, the outputs, the chaos, the data, what does that actually translate to? And we'll still need people to do that. That will probably not be automated. So great reflection. Any other thoughts on that particular topic? Um, again, through the different lenses that all of us bring to the table. Any other reflections on that one? Perhaps I would say um, being comfortable with the lack of clarity. And that is something that we talk a lot about at Roche because people want kind of, you know, so what does this mean? What does this going to look like? How, how will we know um, that, you know, that we've reached the end? And part of what we're, we talk a lot about now is this agile concept, which is that 
we move forward, we move forward with confidence, but as information comes to us, we need to be able to respond to it. Or sometimes we need to, you know, to uh, envision, as Fanny has said, uh, a future that actually doesn't, doesn't exist right now. And so there's no clear pathway um, and that you're going to get into a lot of, I mean, there's gonna be people, people that are gonna push back. There's gonna be people that are, don't agree with you, those kinds of things, but uh, allowing that curiosity and that openness and not needing such structured way of, um, of thinking and learning and success the the less you know you kind of bolt those in the the better it just it allows you to maneuver and to be wherever you need to as the organizations and, and companies and technology and the world changes perfect thank you nita um so i think there's one new question that's popped up um again a, it speaks to the challenge of, of, again, trying to get that first foot in the door and how can you, um, you know, try to focus your, the, the right education or certificates or support or, you know, technical competencies to allow you to get that first piece of experience. So uh, anybody want to take this again, depending on um, different facets, I know, um, there's a plethora of coding and programming so i'm not sure any one is better than the other but uh any any thoughts mel um did you want to reflect on this one yeah and i mean maybe it overlaps a little bit about when about thinking about that future state because um five years ago uh the pharmaceutical industry was immersed in SaaS. And now we as a company, Roche, have shifted to using R. We still use SaaS, um, but if we're hiring a programmer, um, we're, we're looking for R skills. And um, we've partnered with uh, GSK to do uh, some different work within R uh, to standardize things. The FDA is very open to having a submission done in R. Uh, people are starting to ask about Python, <laughs> so it's it's hard to predict what what the programming language in five years will be. Um, right now, it's R, um, which is nice because it's free. You can go online and find all kinds of stuff with R for free. Um, in terms of, I think the question talked about maybe different certificates. Um, I think that like maybe it's like what, what's already been said that if if there's a program out there that maybe can can help just expand your network and help you get that foot in the door, maybe have an internship with it. Why not like give it a shot right I don't think that. Um, uh, it, it's hard to say what the future state's going to be, but um, the more you can upskill technically. Um, the more you're going to be able to contribute, right? I just think of um, all of the automation that uh, we as a company are doing with uh, clinical trials um, and, and uh, uh, writing documents, automating having those documents written. And even as I've been exposed a little bit to that world, it's like there's, there's some things going on in that space that around the, uh, documentation automation that I just could never even have imagined would need to happen, right? So um, that's just one example. Um, I think about how um, the use of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. reading the ocular, the scan of someone's eye to assess their disease severity and using AI to do that rather than um, a qualified radiologist to do that. So there's, I would, I would encourage uh, folks that if, if uh, data science is your passion to continue to upskill and to stay on top of technologies, um, that I think is a, is a huge challenge. I, 
um, I constantly feel behind in terms of technology. And uh, uh, fortunately, my, my, I'm at a, uh, my job is more strategy, not our programming. So I, I, that's, that's okay for me. But we all have to kind of find our niche, right? I guess I'd just like to say that there's a lot, we've talked about this before, right? About growth mindset, about transferable skills, there's a, you can, t you can learn R, anybody could learn R, right? Reasonably intelligent person, kids, like my nephew, he's like 10 and he's better in R than I am. Uh, but there's lots that of those transferable skills, those what we sometimes call soft skills, but I like to call them critical skills that are not so easy to learn. Um, communication is a big one, listening. Um, uh, I'll say growth mindset again, agility, all of those concepts that, um, that uh, are much harder to teach. Uh, maybe take some time and, and assess yourself and think about those more critical skills as well as the technical skills. Mm -hmm. Well said, well said, Melanie. I couldn't agree more. And uh, I think that's for, why we're perhaps being a you know, not giving you a black and white answer because I don't think there is a black and white answer. I think all certificates, all programs, all bring value. And it's probably, again, a combination of what is the right fit for you as an individual aligned with your interests and also connecting in with potential ex experience opportunities. And, you know, the whole kind of technology piece, I think, at least for us in pharma, it, um, you know, Mel, you had a, a great example around the, the imaging example. We have some work going on that's trying to use natural language, NLP, natural language processing, to extract free text from medical records. So again, to help curate and standardize data sets and make it less manual and again, the the and the possibilities are endless so again i think it really does come down to the areas or things that you find interesting and passionate chances are you're going to be able to find a job you just may have to be a bit creative about um, where to look and, and how to make those connections but uh, honestly i think um, there's there's just so many opportunities um, that uh, it just may take a little bit of research and again sometimes it's a connecting the dots and finding the fit. So I know um, we're kind of coming up towards the end of our hour and I wanted to um, give everybody a chance uh, maybe to kind of give one last kind of um, summary and looking for everybody to think about if you had to give one piece of advice for uh, you know people coming into this space, uh, what would it be? Um, so you can take it to whichever lens or uh, thought perspective. And I'm going to start with you, Nisheen, to, to start us off. Um, so what I would say from my own journey is that be a lifelong learner. You're, I feel that you, my skills in the beginning of my career are not the skills that I have now. You know, they've really evolved and I've had to learn. And I think I will continue learning for the rest of my career journey. And the other thing is, I think, you know, be, be your own advocate, be, you know, be compassionate to yourself. So when things don't go the way you expect them to be okay with it and, um, you know, so that you can be more solution orientated and, and remove those roadblocks that you're creating for yourself. That'd be my advice. Amazing, thank you. Fanny, I'm gonna let you go next. I would say the one thing I would do is to embrace the moment and embrace who you are at the moment that you're feeling it. And don't be afraid to do a complete 180 in your career. You can have five, 10 different careers in your lifetime and you will have all these different lenses to contribute as a result of it. So it's okay to be brave and, and make switches in your life. Awesome, thanks Fanny. Emmy, I have you up next. Yeah, I will say with an open mind and an open heart to embrace any changes and believe in yourself. Well said. Mel, I have you next. 
That is, is, wow, it's hard to add to all this greatness. I got to tell you. <laughs> I think it's important to remember that your career isn't separate from your life. It is your life. <laughs> You're going to spend an awful lot of time at work and um, you want to be in a place that brings you joy, that uh, you feel passionate about, um, and that allows you to go to those other parts of your life, your children, your spouse, nature, family, friends, Netflix, and enjoy those parts too. Um, so don't, don't compartmentalize career, job. Um, it's, a, it's a journey and you're never going to arrive. It, that, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm not, I haven't arrived yet and I don't expect to because it's uh, just a, this constant journey that is my life, not just my career. Love it. I think certainly for the last two years with COVID, it has certainly highlighted the, the intersection of, of work and, and personal. Nita, you get to finish this one off. Thank you. Um, I would reiterate what everyone else has said. To add, though, I think there are no make it or break it moments in your life. And so don't judge yourself too harshly you know, the path that you didn't take, the job that you didn't apply for, the job that you applied for and didn't get. Um, the, some of the best things that happen, happen unexpectedly. And they happen because you didn't actually get what you thought you wanted, but got something else and it, uh, and it shifted in you into a very different area. So, um, I would reiterate, you know, what Nasheen said too, is about be kind to yourself. There's, uh, I understand that there must be stressors and that that desire to get going and to get the job and it feels so hard. Um, stay open, uh, try a variety of different things, be really creative in how you go about uh, doing this, but ultimately, you know, just keep trying. And, and uh, I think I speak on behalf of all of us is that we really wish you well in that journey. And on that note, I'm going to pass it back to Ashley on behalf of all of us here at Roche. It's uh, been a true pleasure for us to participate and share our thoughts, answer questions. Um, and we hope you found it helpful. Um, and with that, I'll give it back to you, Ashley. Well, um, wow, honestly, I really wasn't sure what to expect going into tonight. Donna and I had gone back and forth on, um, you know, the questions and, um, but your answers, I have got text messages and, um, you know, emails come through that are really just, it's so much more than data science tonight. You know, I, I really truly do appreciate your honesty and your openness um, and your willingness to share with us. Um, you know, the Uplift program at YWCA was created for moments like this, um, where we could share, you know, lived experiences of other women who are in uh, business and industry. Um, and it's applicable, you know, for any, for any position, women in any position, not just data science. So I thank you so much for that. Um, I thank Donna for all of her time and effort in uh, putting together this evening with uh, the YWCA Cambridge. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you and working alongside you. Um, and thank you so much to all of our amazing speakers tonight. Um, you really did uh, amplify what our program is and uh, what we represent. And um, I, just, I just thank you so much for bringing your knowledge um, and your openness to the table tonight. So also thank you to all of our attendees. Of course, this night wouldn't have went on without uh, folks coming in and wanting to hear um, what, what 
everyone has to say. So thank you so much for your time. We respect your time and um, really do honor and appreciate you being here tonight. I hope you took from it what uh, what you need. And, um, and if you have any questions on our programming, uh, you can always drop me an email um, or go onto our website. And uh, this program is offered through funding um, from FedDef and also um, in affiliation, we have a partnership with um, YWCA Hamilton, who is our program lead. Um, so thank you to them. And uh, yeah, just thank you so much to all of you. I really do appreciate it. And I look forward to hopefully furthering the connections and, um, and moving forward with what we've learned here tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks again. Take care. Take care.